Dear uh, sisters, I want to call you sisters because I don't want you to treat me like an auntie because I don't feel old enough to be an auntie, but I probably am actually. Uh, so, dear sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Fatima Barakatullah. Um, I, you might have read my book, I'm the author of this book called Khadija. Khadija, mother of history's greatest nation. Um, and I recently graduated um, from two Alamiya degrees that I was studying. Alamiya is like the traditional, uh, I would say, the traditional Islamic studies degree from um, usually from India and Pakistan, right? Uh, here in the UK, there are some scholars who set up institutions where. Uh, boys and girls, brothers and sisters could study Islamic, all the Islamic sciences, so things like Arabic, uh, Arabic literature, grammar, and then also the Quran, uh, tafsir, you know, the explanation of the Quran, um, Islamic history, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the life of the uh, Khulafa, the caliphs after him, um, also different Islamic sciences like um, the hadith sciences, you know, how do we know how authentic a hadith is? How was the hadith, um, the hadith, how were they collected? Um, and lots and lots of different subjects like that, all related to Islam. Uh, so they set up these institutions and uh, mashallah, when I was your age, there were, there were no institutions in the UK. And that's why like, uh, I actually went abroad to Egypt when I was 16. Uh, to study in Cairo uh, because I really wanted to study Arabic um, and then after that I came back to the UK I got married um, and I had children but I still really wanted to study Islamic studies and soon after my children got to a certain age um, certain, some institutes started opening up in the UK so then I took advantage of that and I started um, attending those part time. And so although it took a long time, Alhamdulillah, I graduated last year. Um, and at the moment, I'm at a university um, doing a master's in Islamic law. So that's just a little bit of a background for you. Uh, I'm going to go straight into the questions that you've submitted, uh, because at the beginning, you've asked a few questions about um, my background. Uh, I think I've covered some of that. Uh, one of the questions is, why did you want to be a scholar? Did your childhood have any contribution to this decision? I think um, I went to like a regular uh, primary school and secondary school. I went to a girls secondary school in Barnet. You might have heard of it, uh, Queen Elizabeth's Girls School. And um, so, you know, my, my schooling was probably similar to you or to, you know, the average person. Um, but one thing that I did realize at school, because uh, I came from a religious family, my dad is a scholar from India. Um, one of the things I used to realize is that there's a lot of people, there were people around me of different races, different backgrounds. Um, and a lot of them, especially the young people who were my peers, they had a lot of questions that the teachers couldn't really answer. They had questions about life. Um, even growing up, they had questions about Islam. They used to ask me things like, you know, what about this? What about that? Why is this in Islam? And why is that? Um, things they might have heard on the news. Um, you know, and even just me, when I was wearing hijab at school, they would ask me questions. And I used to always go back to my dad and ask him, like, how should I answer this? How should I answer that? And then he used to give me some answers. And so... I, I realized that people around me have a lot of questions about Islam and about life and that I would really like to help people to understand those, the answers to those questions and I wanted to understand the answers to the questions too. So 
the best way for me to do that was to study Islam in more depth. So, uh, yeah, so I think that's what really influenced me. And probably the fact that my dad was a scholar, I think that did influence me because I saw that um, when you're a scholar, um, people, you, you get to help a lot of people. You know, a lot of people would uh, congregate around my parents, like just ask them questions, come even like wherever they moved in the neighborhood. They used to sort of help a lot of people in that neighborhood, whether it was non-Muslims or Muslims. And my mom would teach Quran to the young people, you know, in their neighborhood whose moms often did not know how to read Quran. Um, and my dad used to answer their questions, help them with their issues and things like that. So I think growing up in that kind of high household, it did motivate me. Um, at what age did you start practicing and what motivated you to do so? I would say, uh, because I was brought up in a religious family, I don't think there was a time when I wasn't practicing. I, didn't, I don't think of it like that. I've always felt conscious of Allah because my mum, she really like brought us up loving Allah, talking to us about Allah, uh, making us conscious about the fact that Allah's watching us, Allah's there for us. We can always talk to him no matter what. Um, but I think all of us, it doesn't matter whether you're born in a religious family or not. All of us at some point actually make the conscious decision to embrace Islam properly. Uh, and for me, that was probably when I left home at 16 and I went to Egypt. So my dad took me to Egypt and he left me there. And uh, I had to sort of live by myself with um, st other students sometimes or sometimes by myself. And he would send me an allowance. And there I was all by myself. My parents weren't there. Nobody really could tell me what to do and what not to do. Um, and I was reading all these books about, I was reading really bad books actually. I was reading books about the Saudi royal family and uh, you know, really horrible stories of women who had really bad experiences uh, in Muslim countries and stuff like that. And I started getting really, really depressed about these stories and started to think, you know, is this what Islam is about? This isn't the Islam that I was brought up with, but all these people, they're talking about, you know, an oppressive type of Islam, something that seems so negative. And at that point, I realized, you know what? I have to go into the sources. I need to go right to the beginning. I need to look at the Quran, what the Quran is saying. I need to look at what the Prophet wasallam said. And I need to see what it is for itself, not rely on a book that's written by somebody who maybe had a bad experience, right? So I think for me, and you'll probably find this as well at one point, at some point in your life, there's a point when actually nobody can tell you what to do anymore, right? We, we all grow up and we get to that point. And at that point, it's a very, very pivotal point in your life that you've got to choose your path. You've got to choose your, your path. And what I would suggest to you, and, and this is what happened with me, is that you start from the beginning, you, you go back to the Quran, you connect yourself with the sources of Islam, and you, you choose to embrace Islam yourself <coughs> fully. Um, so, you know, they say you shouldn't... You have to decide which side of the fence you're on, you know? And you have to make the right decision. And I think knowing uh, or hearing about the sorts of families that you're from, I'm sure you know what the right decision is. It's just that sometimes uh, when we realize that actually we've got the freedom to make that decision and we do make that decision, it's much more powerful because now it's something that, it's not just something you're brought up with, it's something that you've chosen. Um, so yeah, that was my background in terms of practicing. Did you have any struggles trying to get closer to the deen and what helped you overcome it? Um, I think all of us have struggles in the sense that, like growing up like in the 80s and 90s, that's when I was, uh, you know, during my, my childhood was in the 80s and 90s. Um, <clears throat> it was a much more racist time in London, in Britain, you know? Like... My mom, when she walked down the street, there was hardly anyone who wore hijab in those days. She was like the only person that we knew. A lot, there were a lot of Muslims, but they were kind of 
not very confident or they didn't really want to show that they were Muslims or whatever. Or maybe they just didn't know. They came from families or, you know, they, they'd migrated. And they didn't really know much about the, the rules and laws of Islam, the, the philosophy of Islam. So um, my, mom was, my mom was very visibly Muslim. And often when we would walk on the streets, somebody would swear at her or shout something or, you know, it was such a racist time compared to today. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to bear that in mind because sometimes, you know, we feel like, well, we're we're living in difficult times. It's like so much Islamophobia or people. But actually, it's a lot better than it used to be. I'm telling you, like, because I lived through it. You know, you nowadays, if you walk with your mum and you're all dressed very, you know, with your hijab and your jilb, nobody's going to say anything. Hardly anyone would ever say anything. Maybe you might have had some bad experiences, but in those days, every time you walked past a white person, it was that's how it was, you know. They would like say something. You Pakis, you this, you that. They would say something, right? Because uh, it was so strange. It was just so not the norm. So alhamdulillah, nowadays, wearing hijab is the norm. It's become the norm. When I was at secondary school, I was the only girl wearing hijab. Like, if you see my end of year, like, uh, photo, it's like, you can spot me straight away because I'm the only one with the white scarf on, right? Everyone else, and, and the longer skirt as well, right? Because everyone else had, like, rolled up their skirts to make them short, and, and I was, like, uh, the only visible Muslim. So that's the kind of time it was, I think, the 80s and 90s. And I'm not going to say that was easy. It's not easy to be the only one in your whole school or your whole class, to look like a Muslim. But because whatever decision I made, like when I started wearing hijab, because I thought to myself, why am I doing this? And because I knew that this was good, and this is from my Lord Allah, the one who created me, who knows what's best for me, that helped me to overcome any like difficulties. Yeah. So uh, also my friends, they used to stick up for me. So I remember once I walked into a youth club um, there was like a non-Muslim youth club and uh, I don't know how I ended up there I just followed my friends and we were just out one day and um, this boy uh, in the youth club he saw me and he said we don't like girls like her coming in here right we don't want girls dressed like that coming in here and my my friend started swearing at him <laughs> and really stuck up for me and he said you know they told him where to go basically um, so one thing that I realized is that, look, you have to st stick by your principles and the good people around you, whether they're Muslims or non-Muslims, they will stand up for you as well. They will stand with you if you stand up for yourself, right, and for what's right. Um, so those are some of the, you know, difficulties in terms of like people asking questions, but then I answered them and, you know, over time you grow more and more confident as a Muslim. Um, and you realize that actually you've got a lot to offer this society you know you don't need to be like a mouse like hiding away and like you're you know you don't have anything to offer you've got a lot to offer we have got a lot to offer if only we would overcome our um self-consciousness uh, we could offer that one more thing i want to tell you about in terms of practicing see one of the dodgy things I did when I was a young person was um, my friends were really into music and um, I got into music quite a lot when I was um, younger and my pair once I sn snuck out I don't know if I should be telling you this uh, but it's okay I'm, I'm old enough now to own my mistakes I, uh, I snuck out and I just sort of arranged with my friends to go to this massive concert Okay, it was at Nebworth Park in Stevenage, and it was the band Oasis. I don't know if you've heard of them. Anyway, and it was like the biggest at the time. It was the biggest concert, outdoor concert in the hist in the world. Right, it's like Guinness World of Records type level. And so we were like really excited. And um, my parents, they sort of, they used to not really. They used to turn a blind eye to certain things that we did. Uh, maybe just thinking, look, you know she'll learn over time you know what's good for her etc um but to be honest they didn't really know about this uh, and i was you know like an older teenager by then 
And so one weekend, we, I went with my friends to this concert. Because <coughs> I'd never been to a concert before. <coughs> I didn't know what it was like. And my friends just kept going on and on about how amazing it was going to be. So I thought, I've got to experience this. And that was quite a life-changing moment for me, actually, in that concert. Because I was standing there in my hijab, by the way. <laughs> I must have looked so stupid. But anyway, I was standing there in my hijab, surrounded by people uh, taking drugs, right? Um, obviously, people sweating. It was like outdoors, right? It was a massive stage. People were really high, like really excited, right? And I was standing there and I was just, I remember, especially like when the concert started and it was so loud and the, 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 the audience was swaying and obviously they were dancing. I remember the thought coming into my head. I hope I don't die here. I really hope I do not die here. And because I just knew there's something wrong with being there. There was just something wrong about it. And for some reason, at that point, Allah made the thought come to my head that the day of judgment is going to be like this, like a sea of people. You know, when you when you hear the description of the day of judgment, where Allah is going to raise everyone from their graves and everyone's going to be standing on this one big piece of land from the beginning of time until the end of time. And they're going to be barefoot, naked. They're all going to be like really worried. How are we going to be coping with this day of judgment? standing there surrounded by like a sea of people as far as I could see there were people and it was like well, everyone was standing it reminded me of that day and I thought to myself oh my god I do not want to be raised on the day of judgment with these people around me you know it was really scary and I realized the people who I hang around the people who I the places that I go to are going to be the way I'm going to be raised on the Day of Judgment. You know, those are going to be my people. Those are going to be the sorts of people that I want to be raised with. And sadly, what I experienced there was, is this it? Is this it? Is this what you think happiness is? And to me, it was like ridiculous. It was laughable. It was like, so you jump around in a muddy, <laughs> on a muddy field, right? With these probably drug fueled performers and you're all taking drugs and this is how you're finding your meaning and that's what it was for my friends you know they were trying to find meaning in life and that's what that experience was for them and my mind went back to like a few years ago when I'd been on on Umrah with my parents you know going around in Tawaf and that's the only time before that that I had been surrounded by so many people and I remember thinking, subhanAllah, that was, that was real ecstasy. That was real, that was a real high, you know? That was a true high. And I was thinking, subhanAllah, I wish these people could experience that high. Because they haven't lived. If they think this is being high, right? And having to go to some bucket and toilet and in the corner. Seriously, it was, it was disgusting, you know? And that's their, their, their definition of a very amazing, meaningful amazing experience I just thought subhanallah this is I've got something that's way more precious I've got something way more precious and that day I made the decision I'm never gonna go to a concert again and I didn't you are the love when no one near is close to us if there's one thing I know is that seasons come and go but Allah will keep you warm and break through the hearts of stone He can make you